September the day after, um, Dr. Tanisha Pabu will um, do a presentation on ICD-10 coding and a discussion. <clears throat> well, um, just to introduce Dr. James, um, Dr. James is a renowned and published orthodontist based in Ontario, Canada. He has co-authored a series of peer-reviewed articles on various cranial displacements and its relationship to malocclusions. These articles describe how an understanding of osteopathic principles can expand orthodontic diagnosis and treatment possibilities. He considers that, the dental, that dental professionals have the opportunity to play a major role in the health field far beyond its present concentration on aesthetics. Gavin, a warm South African welcome to you. It's been a long time in coming. I've yeah. known you for a couple of years and I'm privileged to be able to host you this evening. Thank you for being part of this event and good luck with your evening. Before the recording starts, however, you, I believe that there is something you wish to share with us. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Des. And the one thing I want to mention is that the, the, much of what I will use through my presentation, and indeed much of what has been part of my life for so long, is in one particular article, which you can access quite readily. If you go to my website, I'll be giving you the address for that. Look up articles and you'll see a set of 10 articles by my colleague, Dr. Dennis Stroken and myself. Number 10 is about ex palatal expansion. It's an extensive article. It has, among other things, seven patients treated according to the, the theme we've been developing. I think you'll find in it quite enough um, to perhaps hopefully agree with and quite enough to challenge your thinking. Having said all that, I, will now go, I also look forward to answering questions at the end of our presentation. I hope, I really do hope, I can make this as fun to do as it's been for, for me. And this is a, and from here on, I should speak in my official voice, but I'm happy to talk to you with a question and answer. And I'm quite old enough to have survived a few hurdles along the way. So <laughs> and I've been wrong a few times and I'm quite happy to accept that possibility. It's one of the, one of the luxuries of being this age gives you the privilege of having been wrong. In fact, it would be terrifying if you hadn't been wrong. So over to our official presentation. And I look forward to speaking with you at the end of that. Thank you, Gavin. The recording now will, will now start. Gavin, you can just um, stop your video. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. And don't forget to, un to mute as well. Good morning. My name is Gavin James. I'm an orthodontist, and I'd like firstly to thank the South African Dental Association for having the imagination and the courage to invite me to speak. I've taken a serious look at the speakers who have been here before me and who are still to come. A number of them I know and have worked with, and I'm very, very impressed at what's happening to dentistry as a whole, and indeed to medicine. Uh, it does, however, leave my specialty a little bit in the dust. Uh, as an orthodontist, I have to recognize the time has come to change. So what I'm hoping to do is offer you some decent reasons as to why I think we'll have to learn something new. And I hope you'll enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed presenting it. Hi again. What I'd like to do now is walk you through what I've been discussing. That 
orthodontics in the 21st century is a clarion call to my colleagues, whom I hope some of them are listening. Uh, the title below it gives you all the paraphernalia I had to acquire to become a specialist in Britain in the last century. The one that I'm particularly proud of is the MDS, which was a Master of Dental Surgery. In practice, it was a study in comparative anatomy. And that's when I really started, started to look at my specialty in a different way. If you wonder where some of the information is coming from, all of it is available at my website, www.orthodontic.ed. Everything in there is for free, and I hope you'll find the time and the leisure to read it. It's open to criticism. It's my attempt to put into a palatable form an introduction to what I think is the most exciting step to happen, not just in dentistry, but in medicine as a whole. So let's go from here. I'm going to recommend several books, not to sell any of them, but I think they'll shortcut how we're getting to the new place. James Oshman is an, was, is an, osteo, an, os, me, is an osteopath, and he has done some beautiful work in energy medicine. He has some very powerful Nobel Prize winners behind him, but let's just take what he's presented. Energy Medicine in Therapeutics is a book I highly recommend because it doesn't go chapter and verse. It gives what are called hypotheses. It offers you suggestions and says, here's how to look at them and here's how to make the best use of the information. So it isn't a, a sort of take it or leave it kind of textbook. It's an invitation to join him in his search for answers. I like the style and I try to practice it myself. So let's look at energy medicine and therapeutics. One of the first things we meet is an interesting character called Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster Fuller was an ingenious character early in the last century, uh, but he was all far more than just that. He was an architect and has been known principally for his skill in architecture. That's the best known one. However, he is also an outstanding mathematician, a designer, an engineer, qualified engineer, and a futurist. And at first sight, at once, the problem of being, um, this is known as a polymath. And a polymath, the trouble is when you see someone like this is, it looks average skill and a whole number of skills in the different disciplines. It doesn't work like that at all. He was brilliant in all the things he tackled. And among other things, he looked for help from other people. Kenneth Nelson was a sculptor who became tied into Buckminster Fuller because of Bucky's, I'll call him Bucky for short. Buckminster Fuller had some very ingenious ideas to introduce to an audience. Kenneth Nelson was in one of his audiences. So let's see what Buckminster was talking about. This is known as a Bucky ball. And what it represents is an early attempt by Buckminster Fuller. It's the American pavilion, which was erected for the Expo expedition in 1967 in Montreal. I didn't get to see it, but I knew of it. And there were some remarkable features about a Bucky ball. One is the architecture can be designed off site and the building can be constructed in parts. The parts are all consist of an outward frame. There's no center core holding this building up. The walls are strong enough to hold the entire weight up. Here is what the actual principle involved. Buckminster Fuller discovered from, from his work that if you put a series of aluminum poles with together with a continual wire, you've got a structure made of continuous tension. That's between all due to all the stainless steel wire and intermittent compression. That's the aluminum struts composed of the structure. The, the wire therefore is providing the tension and the struts 
are, prevent, are providing the interrupted compression. So this is a great capacity to meet. And it's about 70 feet in, in height and will withstand all extremes of temperature and height. If we put the same structure on its side, then suddenly we see something rather different. It begins to look like the structure of an animal. We can take this as, this, as you like the backbone of an animal. Uh, there are no supporting ropes to keep this thing up. It is self-supporting and that support comes from within the structure itself. Even if we lower an animal's head out of the end of this, it will still support it without having a series of guy ropes put in above it to hold the head up. So this is tensegrity now beginning to come into a biological form. So where did this word, where this word come from? Tensional integrity is what they call a portmanteau word and is made up of tensional and integrity. And Buckminster Fuller calls it tensegrity. And it is an entity on its own right. And he used it widely in architecture. About oh, 40 years ago, somebody in the biological world looked at tensegrity and said, that can apply to living materials. This is not confined to building materials. And he called it biotensegrity. So from an architectural concept, we move to a very live concept and live organisms function using biotensegrity as the means of doing so. So, so we'll let's look at this. Two notable individuals were able to contribute to this. Stephen Levin it is, I just retired, a, an orthopedic surgeon in Washington, D.C. And his looking at the needle tower, as the structure was called, that made him very uncomfortable with how he was undertaking his surgery. So he decided to work out what biotensegrity was all about. And in doing so, he had to modify the surgery he was practicing. Donald Ingber is a Harvard biologist who, coming from a different direction, arrived at much the same sort of conclusions as Levin had already arrived at. They have both come to the same ideas, but from two different points of view. Donald Ingber, as far as I know, was the first scientist to have anything published in this, and it was in the Scientific American in January 1988 if you wish to look up what he's talking about. Another contributor to this, and this time it's called biotensegrity, the structural basis of life, is coming from yet a third man called Graham Scar. Graham was an osteopath. I'll talk about that in a moment. But osteopaths saw the world rather differently from the rest of us. And I'll also discuss this as we go. And a, a, a nucleus, a cell as we understand it, as I was certainly as I was taught in the 1950s when I was studying at this level, a nucleus is a, has all the knowledge that the cell needs to survive. This was what I was taught. The, 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 the nucleus is surrounded by a cell membrane that keeps things together more or less. And the, in there are two or three what you might call batteries or organelles which help drive the nucleus to, to be alive. So this is an alive structure, a vital structure. And it was my thinking, as indeed was everyone else's, was the nucleus was the center of the whole thing. But that was to tolerable and accepted for many years. But about 40 years later, and the electron microscope had been invented, invented and came up with a rather different idea of what tensegrity and what biotensegrity was all about. So taking us from the top, first thing is there is a double layer to that thin skin around the cell. This is diagrammatic, of course, but I have to do that to explain how the cell actually works. This is good for all of us, from the smallest cell 
through something as hugely complicated as a human being. So the cell is double layered, but across the cell run a series of enzymes, which are called integrins. And the integrin is a special enzyme that connects the center of the cell to the tissue outside. Well, I think we can understand that. It means that the cell influences the structures around it. It's immediate structures are around it. Well, I think we can accept that. We understand that. But what Candace Pert, the lady who invented all this, discovered was it's a two-way system. The external membrane, let's go down to the bottom of the page, and it's called the extracellular matrix. Or another name is called the living matrix. The living matrix is a tissue that fills in the, organ the organism between all the different cells. So we find the organ surrounded by cells. There's something outside the cell can influence what's going on inside the cell. This is big news, but we thought we couldn't change how a cell behaved. But we can by controlling the extracellular matrix. So let's explore this a little more, because this is the step that's been missing for us. What I'd like to do now is translate this idea, this Newtonian concept, into a quantum concept. Basically, in Newton's world, if you applied force at A, then it would be transmitted to B, and then C, D, and then E. I think we can all understand this, because this is the world we live in. And on the other hand, if we look at the one below, we're into something very different. If I apply force at A, it can be transmitted to B, but it can also be transmitted to C, or to E, or to D. And an equal force is applied back at A. So I think it's logical that we're going to get something different. And a very good way of explaining this is if I choose to kick a stone down the road, uh, and I know at the weight of my force against the stone, I know the weight of the stone, I know how far it will travel. It's going from a position of equilibrium. I kick it, it's out of equilibrium, and then due to the friction of the road and the weight of the stone, it then comes to a halt. Now, if I know the force I use to make it move, and the weight of the stone, and the amount of energy caused by the friction, then I can work out pretty well how far that stone's going to go. That's our everyday world that we all experience. Now let me shift to a different kind of image. Let's say I come across a large bad-tempered dog, and I'm unwise to give it a sharp kick in the ribs. Not good thinking, but let's do it. I can then expect several possibilities but I can't predict exactly which one. But a bit of common sense says, one of maybe I'm going to have to retreat in a hurry, but the dog's reaction is unpredictable. Well, to a certain extent. If it's a really fearsome dog, I may be the one that has to retreat. If it's a cowardly dog, it may see me about to kick it again, and it retreats. This illustrates very nicely a complicated idea by all biological organisms, in this case the dog, but it could be us, reacts differently than I would reasonably expect. So let's translate into how it applies in other areas. On the left, we have the world as I was taught. You have muscles, you have an insertion, an origin, a nerve supply, a blood supply, and an action. And that was how I learned my anatomy. On the right, we have how, how things really happen. There's one continuous stretch of muscle runs from the heel up, crosses all the joints, all the way up, right up the back of the neck, and is attached to the just above the eyebrows. So in the real body, you have a continuous stretch of myofascial tissue running from the heel all the way up to the eyebrow. This has consequences for you and for I. This may be understood and explored by an osteopath. This, I have to say at this point, 
we look for allies in our understanding. And the group with far away the most to put to give us are known as osteopaths. I recommend Tasha's book for several excellent reasons. First of all, it was published less than six months ago. This is as up to date as you can get. But uh, um, Natasha herself has had the, the wisdom or the interest to study how her skills apply in dentistry and in orthodontics and in physical physiology totally. So Tasha brings skills that I didn't have. And indeed, the diagram on the outside shows just this. On the left of the diagram is what we would like to see on the individual. On the, on, on the, on the right, rather, on the left, we'll see what most kids look like in reality. They have a head forward position, the face is down forwards, and this is what you see surrounding you in life. What we would like to see is the one on the right. So it's clearly Ta Tasha has something. Well, among our many conclusions, and this is from her book with her permission, we'd like to see some of the things that could happen to us. On the, on the left, we have the normal way of getting birth. You should come out head first and with the head turned toward the anterior bit of the pelvis. This is a normal position and a presentation. With a bit of luck, the head should get through there, followed by the body, and then come out out of the birth canal and with the head up and backward, if you like, out of the, out of the head. And all sorts of forces are acting on this poor kid as it comes out. If we look at the diagram on the right, this is just one of the many mishaps that can happen to an infant trying to get born. This is one of the most hazardous times in life. In fact, hazardous throughout life, because what can go wrong here can affect you for the rest of your life, not just in a minor way, but in a seriously, in and a serious way that will affect your ability to perform many actions. So what, how can I be sure of this? In the marvels of the, the, the new technology world, it's possible using magnetic, magnetic resonance imaging to record what happens to infants, newborn infants in the birth canal. And this is taken from the, a journal published in 2019, not three years ago. And what you see in the first slide, top of the slide, is the infant in the top, the top of the birth canal before it starts down towards the exit. That is the infant, its face looks normal, the brain looks pretty normal. And on the right, you see the same infant from another view, showing that the bones of the skull are actually quite separate. They're separate because otherwise the infant would never get out of the birth canal. And in some cases, indeed, it can't. And you have to end up with a forced C-section. That's serious business, both for the infant and for the mother. What happens more likely, we see in the lower diagram. It's not a diagram, it's actual records of what the infant, outline of the infant in the birth canal. On the left side, we see the infant sitting at the top of the birth canal, waiting to start its journey down towards its exit. Note the shape of the face and what shape of the, oh, I'm sorry about that. In the, in the lower diagram, we see it on what, the line at the bottom of the birth canal. On the one side, the face is getting squashed up. And if we look at the diagram on the, left, the right, we see how twisted the face has become. So between the start of being born and the point of it being expelled from the birth canal, the infant's head has taken a severe beating with considerable distortion occurring. And it doesn't take an imagination to see what happens to the rest of the body in this process. It's just made most, more obvious when you watch what happens to the head. I put this into a simpler diagram that I think will help you understand this much better. On the left, we have 
the real world. That's the world in which you and I live. On, on the vertical axis is the stress given to a subject. They've called it the load. And on the horizontal, the diagram is called the stream or the effect. So what happens on that vertical axis creates a reaction on the horizontal axis. So the idea is the more load I apply to the structure, the more effect I get. So let's just look at that. The more I apply here, then that is transmitted through base waves and I get response here. So the more I can afford to load this up, the more I can get the thing to move. Sounds good. Until you get to about here. Now what happens in real life is let's just say you're pushing, lifting a load with a crane or running your car at high speed. At a certain speed with that car, if you're not paying attention, you'll see a light come on indicating it's in the danger zone. Anything that happens from that point onwards is going to put the whole structure at extreme danger. And this actually happens in buildings. If the building is built with poor quality materials and you get up to here, if that's, the building is now stretched out beyond its, its parameters to survive and you, it becomes very shaky indeed and is very much affected by any action in this last stretch. So this is a zone to watch out for. So how do we handle that in real life? Well, if I'm sitting in a crane, 100 feet up in the air, I'm in a little cabin watching what's going on down below, and my crane man loads something onto the end of my crane that overloads the crane's ability to lift it, I'm in trouble. That crane could come tumbling down with me in the cockpit, and I don't really think I want that. So a crane operator pays a great deal of attention to his cottage mate, who I'm sure is a valuable, a valuable companion. His mate is making sure he doesn't overload the system. If he overloads it, he puts the crane driver at serious risk, or if you're running your car, you're into a danger zone. That's why you have control mechanisms to let you know when this happens, okay? Now this is quite true of common sense architecture and engineering or, or bodywork. Bodywork's on the same problem. So let's go over here. Now what do we have here? Well, this is the action of a live body. I call it, we call it an organism, but really what we want to talk about is an actual body because it is already, it's already under stress. The load has been increased very little when you compare it with that with that. There's very little load here, but look what has happened. The stress, such as it was, has permitted the object to move along to here. In other words, this is not the same kind of machine as this. This is a biological machine functioning in a biological way. It is not functioning in this way, which is a mechanical. Newtonian thinking. So let's see what happens when we push enough on this load. The load it pushed along here, we get a good deal of coverage with very little additional load on the system. That's great. If I can do my orthodontics down here, I'm much less likely to run into problems. But the trouble is, if I keep loading this system up, I start running into a brick wall of resistance. Unlike the, the diagram on the left, it doesn't get freaking, it doesn't freak out, you get frail and break when it gets too high. This goes the other way. The organism, whatever it is, con condenses down, it becomes much, much more solid. And the harder I push over here, the harder I push here, the more it resists me. And this is exactly what happens in the body and of course in orthodontics. So right here we stumbled on one of the great fallacies of the orthodontic treatment. It was an orthodontist reaching, making a problem down here. Less is good, more is better. It doesn't work like that in biology. What we have to say is completely contradictory. 
more is less. And it sounds like a philosophical thing I pulled out of the air. This was experienced many years ago by, by osteopaths. And what then to compound that one, if I go up to here, what I really got to think is more that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. What it means, if I got the whole thing working together, it's much greater than if I took the parts separately. To translate that back into our terms over here, it means that something different happens if I overload this system, and it's not all what I want. But let's recognize it. Up to here, I'm doing fine. If I keep pushing, 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 I get more and more and more resistance. And this is literally what happens in the body. The very last thing I need when I'm looking for really good movement, I walk into something as solid as this. That diagram actually, in a way, sums up the problem of this whole presentation. Why do we see bodies functioning differently from Newtonian forces? And this whole, in a way, this webinar is about just that, because we live in Newtonian worlds and our daily lives are lived in Newtonian worlds, but you and I function as, uh, as uh, in, in a quantum world. We're subject to quantum forces, but we choose not to recognize that. Now, there's some different, there are some benefits arise from the idea of this. This is what I would call the skeleton of a cell. I've taken out all the other bits, but left the supporting systems and uh, that keep it in place. And they really can be represented as a series of posts and a series of wires. So make, think of this as a wire and this is a post. It's exactly the same thing as we looked at earlier. We looked at the tensegrity thing, but here it is represented within a cell. When I push on that cell with my hand, it's not going to get soft. And what is going to happen is the energy I'm putting into that is immediately dispersed through the whole system. It isn't kept localized. The very action of pushing on an organism like this is to spread the load out through the whole body. So what happens up here is re repeated here, here, and here. What's happening to the organism, it's getting tired, tired of having the pushing. It's going to change as well. So let's see what that takes. So let's see what this means for us as orthodontists, ready to try and carry out some techniques. Before we do so, we want to remember there's a patient at the end of all this stuff. And the patient has their own way of putting in some sort of feedback. Let's see hallelujah for that. But that feedback is our guideline of how to do orthodontics properly. We're not banking on some arbitrary figure we pull into a hat. We're banking on the body telling us what's too much. Now let's look at this and see what on earth has this got to do with moving teeth. This is a patient of 15 years of age with quite severe headaches, jaw problems, and a whole bunch of things I'm not going to go over with you. But she is unable to sleep at night. This is her trying to ease her burden. She knows from hard experience that if she pushes up on her right hand and puts, it, she gets some benefit. And if she puts her third, the fifth finger in the mouth, she can hold the lower jaw in a stable position. And she's fingers there. So she's pushing up on one side and the fingers over here are helping her to push up. So she's pushing her head to one side. And this one here is also pushing hard. So what he's doing with his, with his forefinger, he's got it immediately behind the maxilla, the front bone. And as I think you can see, he's pushing hard with his forefinger to push the complex of bones forward. In fact, he's a class two division one with the ears stick out and the, the eyes are usually have dark shadows below them. This whole mid face in birth, but pushed too far backwards. And what he's trying to do with his hand is correct it. And you see, what's 
That's guesswork. How many else can you do that? Well, so we have to start thinking of the mouth as being integrated with the whole body. This shows it offers a much more comprehensive understanding of malocclusion. Orthodontic treatment has to become part of a general body response, not just a cosmetic service primarily concerned with the teeth. A live organism is a non-linear, dynamic, complex, self-organizing system far from equilibrium. It has extreme sensitivity to initial conditions and is independent of gravity. And this is coming from Ilya Prigogin, who is a Nobel Prize winner. So we take it that he's had some major rethinking of what's happening. Extreme sensitivity, which he mentioned, in initial conditions mean that a very small change early in development results in major difference later in the developmental process. Okay, this was first discovered in weather forecasting. In orthodontics, it offers the potential for radically changing an outcome by suitable early intervention. So we have to look for probabilities in analyzing growth, not certainties. Every live organism, be it a cell to the complexities of the human body, reacts to a cell of a level of force which is specific to itself and which will enable it to act with maximum efficiency. And the force to be applied has to be biocompatible to achieve this. Biocompatible in this sense means it's not too heavy and it's not too light. It's just right to stimulate activity. So let's just carry that through one example. Here's an individual who came in 15 years old and she had a malocclusion. But as you can see on her patients on the right side, the teeth are trapped inside the lower ones. Uh, on the left side, they're positioned normally. On the right, on the patient's right, the teeth are all forward about the width of a tooth. And the upper center line is off to the patient's left. In the lower, in the lower situation, lower slice, lower arch, the tooth is in its good solid class one occlusion, but the lower center line is off to the right. So the center lines don't match up. And here's we look at the mouth on the right side, we'll see that the teeth are in good class one occlusion, what you'd like to see. On the left side, if you look at the arch, you see there's a, bit, there's a difference in the shape of the arch. It's controlled. The molar on the right side is rolled forwards and the teeth are quite contracted. And if you look carefully, you see that the teeth on the right are nearer to the midline than the teeth are on the patient's left. So one side is closer to the midline than the other side. And here is the patient when we see her. Now, this is what's called an ALF appliance, and there's a particular reason for using it. However, in this case, I decided to put brackets on the lower teeth and use that as my arch while I corrected the upper arch. I knew it was crooked, and I knew how to get my center lines matched up, but I did it the simplest way I knew how. I put an ALF appliance in the upper arch and then ran an elastic from here to here, so we're pulling the arch back on this side, and on the other side, we just left it as is. So we set off, oh, that should have been the slide. We're off doing this, and here we are uh, halfway there. The center lines are beginning to match up. This is the final stage when I persuaded my patient to let me place brackets on the front teeth, just to tidy things up. And here she is finished. I think, except she's a, a good result. The patient was happy, her GM joints problem were controlled, and the teeth were kept in place. I had, I used an upper removable retainer to keep things stable for about six months, then removed it, kept a close eye on the patient. There were no further problems at that time, and she remained stable 
and continue to do so when I last heard from her. So the face has changed. We can see that. And this is just a little more close. The face gives us all kind of indications. I'm going to have to look closely to see them. Again, a little bit of change in the outline of the face. She's standing a little differently. But let's look what happened to the palate. Here is her palate before we started. This is it outlined here, and the nose is blocked up. And here she is on completion of treatment and stable. Look at what's happening to the nose here as it pays to that. We've opened up the mid face and changed her ability to breathe properly, apart from correcting our GM joint. Okay, orthodontics is more likely to succeed when it uses the body's own healing systems to correct itself. And that, now there are biological indicators available which can be used to inform the clinician of the effects of his or her intervention. The goal is to have biocompatibility through all the systems. The result is much more likely to remain stable after the retainers have been removed. There we go. Gavin, thank you very much for, can you hear me, Gavin? Yes. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for a, a, a most fascinating and a wonderful presentation. I know that this has opened the eyes of all the colleagues, I'm sure, who attended this evening's presentation. Um, we do have some questions, Gavin. Um, so I'll pose those to you. Um, <clears throat> one of the first um, questions is a matter of occlusion, malocclusion, and temporomandibular joint dysfunction. And how does that fit into the biotensegrity paradigm? Um, the reason for the controversy, I think, is that many folks say that moving teeth and orthodontics causes temporomandibular joint dysfunction. What are your thoughts in that regard? I think whoever thought that, TM, that orthodontic treatment could cause TMJ problems is exactly what I thought the first half of my career. Somewhere around about the middle of my career, I realized we've not quite got that right. That the problem was there beforehand, or it may not even have been there before the orthodontic treatment. But orthodontists essentially ignored what happened in the joint. It was a serious miss, missing piece of their thinking and diagnosis. So they saw you know, to interpret a TM joint problem as caused by orthodontics was unforgivable. It simply did not fit the pattern. So in fact, a TM joint problem has been misunderstood from birth onwards to old age. I, I say this well aware of how important it has been at different ways along the, the orthodontic history. In the child, a TMJ problem may be present, but not significant. In an adult, they may complain of symptoms setting off a whole battery of things, but no one associates it with the joint TM joint problem. There are several excellent orthodontists who do work with TM joints, and there are several of my colleagues in this problem, in this program, who are excellent working with the TM joint. But the key goal is to put the joint into a position of balance, and let's see what we have to do with that first, and then work out how we treat orthodontically or cranially. In fact, we may not even need to go to orthodontics. It may be an osteopath can look after this patient much better than I can. It's kind of humbling at first to realize that you are the, the, god, the god you thought you were, and someone else knows a great deal more about the joint than I do. And at one point, oh, about 40 years ago, surgery was the answer for a DM joint problem. It was tough. Wrong call again. The joint was surgerized 
and indeed the patient may often often end it up worse than before. So I would say, and the Scots were saying, it says, gang warily, be careful. And the first thing I do is relieve the patient's symptoms. I may do nothing other than that as a first step and stay like that for several months while I find out what the body is really telling me. Maybe this is a postural problem at work. Maybe it belongs in a posterior cranial problem. Maybe the head is misfitting. It may even be a, a problem with strabismus. I can list many symptoms which can be contributed to this. So the first step for me is find a point of stability for the patient and then work out how do I go from there. Wonderful. Thank you, Gavin. That was, I think, the most comprehensive reply I've heard to that question ever. The um, point to ask, though, is how do you stabilize the patient's symptoms? Um, um, do you use medication? Do you use a temporomandibular joint splint? Um, it would be most helpful for our attendees to just get an idea of how you would look at. I think the first thing, if I look in the mouth and, I, and the patient reports a TMJ problem, apart from looking for possible causes, there's always a question of what I'd call association and cause and effect. So I want to be sure that this has a dental component because this TMJ problem may be caused by something quite alien to, to my field of expertise. So the first mm -hmm. thing is establish that this is a jaw cause problem. I have a colleague help me. The best person I have is an osteopath. If indeed my osteopath tells me yes, and I can, I can test, I personally can test my patient in various ways, very simply putting slots between teeth, if you like, it would be called a diagnostic splint. I have my patient wear it for two, perhaps three months. And usually within that time, I've been able to relieve them of their primary symptoms, control the clicking, help the joint to start healing. That doesn't mean I solved the problem. It just means I brought the body into a position of balance where it mm -hmm. can do what it wants to do. The body wants to heal. It doesn't like discs anterior to it. Least of all, does it like what is called a closed lock in dental terms, where the disc mm -hmm. is jammed in front of the condyle and the patient can open maybe 30 millimeters. That doesn't apply. That the first step is to relieve the patient of pain and give them something close to normal function. For that, I have to introduce some artificial device to help them obtain that. And I start from then in working out how do I solve this problem long term. I'm not responsible for every TM joint problem. But I, before I step in, mm -hmm. I better understand what causes this particular patient to have a problem. They may not need me at all. Mm -hmm. and, and that way I become the patient's friend. I may not, no, I may lose a customer, but I win a friend. Well, because that's someone else, you're better. <laughs> absolutely. Gavin, then <clears throat> that begs the question do you find when you place a form of device, that if the mandible maxilla are out of balance, do you find that that device will then lead to a repositioning possibly of the mandible relative to the maxilla, which could then indicate where that mandible wants to be? Exactly, and that, that other position is where I'm starting from. If you start with TMJ problem with the teeth in full occlusion, I have no idea of what I'm dealing with. I genuinely say to the family, if it's a child, I can only relieve their immediate symptoms and then let's see what we've got. I learned mm. that long ago. Make mm. no promises, step into it carefully, well aware that other skills and health skills may have a much better answer than I have. It keeps you humble. 
Uh, and it also helps you to listen to the patient carefully. Absolutely. Um, and of course, of uh, uh, um, at the moment, the whole issue of airways and sleep, etc., are very pertinent. Would you be prepared to share some thoughts with us on the whole issue of facial development and airways um, and the whole issue of sleep? Because so many patients are now being treated with mandibular advancement appliances plants, and, and, and <clears throat> my experience has been that they're looking at the how. They have this these little concepts and they're using an appliance and looking at how can they relieve the snoring, et cetera, and not necessarily looking at the why. Are you of the opinion that there is a link between facial development and airway development, malocclusions, posture, etc.? This has been well researched and I'd be very foolish indeed if I didn't recognize my predecessors who did a much better job than I did. If you want to see where it starts, then at the very start is I look at the birth process itself because most of the major problems I see as an orthodontist come in the first two years after birth. I say that with every confidence. As a, an orthodontist of long standing, I've learned that what happened much earlier than I ever saw the patient probably matters far more in what I'm going to treat. And that, so that the first step is resolve what really is the cause. An airway is often the symptom of another problem. It may be an airway blockage further back, and I must know what's causing that. I have to understand, and I think. This is best approached as a team. Because I have specialists who are much better at reading airways than I am. A nasal surgeon, an orofacial surgeon may be much better at this. A cranial osteopath may be much better at this than I am. But I need their help. This is not a, a, lone, a lone game, as it long has been seen for a dentist. Put a piece of acrylic in there and you can solve most of the problems. You'll be very, very lucky if you got away with that. And sadly, many of our patients have been treated just like that. The dentist knows enough to put something between the teeth and that changes everything. But he's only looking at the one problem. And the patient feels a lot better, but as soon as you start wearing whatever that piece of plastic is, within days, they're back to where they were and the patient is back into a lifelong program of pain and discomfort, but can only get worse. So I share my knowledge, and I'm very fortunate to have a group of friends and colleagues. I regard them as friends, and we share our problems. Nobody has all the answers. Or maybe, maybe God has, or maybe Einstein, but I, I don't. I need help. And I'm very willing to and happy to tell patients as a, and the family that I can see a problem here, but I really want you to see my colleague down the road and maybe she can something offer, offer something better. And the patients are usually very happy that I'm not trying to grab their treatment and charge them some substantial fee when I'm not really sure of something. So uncertainty is not something I am ashamed of. That is a name of biology. So I hope that resolves that a little bit. Thank you, Gavin. <clears throat> My apology, I lost the feed there for about half a minute, but I'm pretty confident that the question was answered perfectly. Um, I, I saw you looking. I saw you looking a little blank and I got a bit worried. <laughs> <laughs> That's my usual state. <laughs> I am um, Gavin. I'm thrilled to have colleagues. I'm sadly very few from the orthodontic ranks, but happily from the group who are still willing to understand we're learning, learn, learning, and learning. So welcome yeah. to the club. Thank Absolutely. You. And Gavin, um, what are your thoughts about myo 
functional appliances. Um, when it comes to early treatment, one sees wonderful results with uh, myofunctional appliances, not just in tooth alignment, but also in jaw re if one could if I could describe it as jaw repositioning and the correction of um, cranial distortions. What what are your opinions? You ask that question very carefully. And, the, and <laughs> I think I understand why. <laughs> I have a number of colleagues <laughs> who are very good at treating the immediate problem. They get the patient comfortable. And the temptation is to say, I can go ahead and treat what is basically very, very often an asymmetrical face and an asymmetrical jaws and an asymmetrical body, I can treat this with a symmetrical device. And that, I think, is a fatal misconclusion. You have to step back. I start my examination with the patient standing. I have them walk around a bit. I have to see them moving. Movement and form are absolutely fundamental. This is not a static situation, and I cannot treat it as a static problem. Form is essential, and it is most important I understand where the malformi malformation is coming from. Maybe as a leg is one shorter than the other. Maybe the head back here just above the neck is seriously misaligned. Maybe the vertebrae are out of place. And how do I know that without skill and without some intelligent observation of the patient? So patient experience is a, is a big help in stepping, but in the first step, relieve a patient of pain, then mount them up in as balanced a way as you can on an articulator and see what that tells you. I study the face carefully. I study them the models mounted in a position of first contact. I take an occlusal registration with the teeth apart. I know where the teeth are when they close fully. That doesn't really interest me. What I want to know is the teeth before they actually hit because they're going to deviate. And that deviation will tell me a great deal about what their underlying problem is. So the teeth have to be seen in both as a solution, but as a strong indication of the problem. So for a dentist who ignores a malfunction, does so at risk, at risk of putting in a crown that's going to mis misinform the patient of what's best. And the patient will say, I had all this dental work done at great expense, and I'm worse off than when I started. They certainly say this about orthodontics. So I think we all share responsibility for sizing up to our share of misunderstanding of the patient's body and what it is trying to tell us. The body doesn't lie. Our mistake is in misreading the story it's telling us. Absolutely. And Gavin, just another <clears throat> what might seem silly question, but in the absence of an osteopath, because not uh, South Africa, I believe, has 11 osteopaths. Not everyone has access to an osteopath. Would a chiropractor or a physiotherapist um, be of any value to work with? That's, that's, I'm really, I asked Faisal about this, and he said, you had 11 osteopaths in Joburg, which is not much use if the patient's a thousand miles away. So I think two thoughts to this is a chiropractor who's willing to listen and understands what you're wanting is a great help. I work with some excellent chiropractors. They have been shamefully abused by the medical profession, which indeed is what is a true of osteopaths. Ontario has kept osteopaths out altogether. I had to, I, as I said earlier, I had to kiss a few frogs before I found a princess underneath the frog. You have to look 
around. You have to ask questions and take colleagues and other disciplines out for, or sit for lunch. And we have a discussion. Can we find enough common ground that between us, we can figure out how to help the patient? And I, work, I go to an osteopath's office or the, the chiropractor will come to my office and we have a discussion with the patient there about how we mutually might help the patient. We each learn something. I never fail to learn something from my colleague, even although his name is not osteopath. Even better, he may be a physiotherapist who is beginning to understand part of this. The part that is missing for most of them is the cranial contribution. But I am sure somewhere in the cultural background of South Africa, there are people treating the crania. This is not unique to Western civilization. It's well practiced in other bodies of science. Asian culture has a strong tradition of this going back 5,000 years. So I really do not know enough about African culture. Life began in Africa. I don't hesitate for a moment in knowing they found solutions. One of the best examples is the work of um, what, 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 what a very famous Pope, Magnet, Tilar de Jarda. If you want to know, one of the most famous biologists in history who did all his work in Africa and then China. And he found his way to solutions, knowing nothing about him the mouth or the teeth. So other bodies have found ways to answer. The mouth becomes inappropriate, even better. And the great slide, if someone wants to look at it, are done by one of the most brilliant orthodontists of the last century, a man called Arne Bjork. He took himself to Lima, Peru, and he looked at 147 skulls, which had all been through the head binding process. He can be found in the, a Journal of Dental Research, 1967, which means it's been pretty well hidden for everybody. And what he shows in a brilliant single article is a series of misformed heads and faces. And the patient gets by just fine because of his diet and the environment he lived in. That article kept me very, very humble for most of my orthodontic career. As I had taught, I knew all about cranial faults. I knew all about jaws. And here's this man whom I admired hugely telling me, you missed something. Patients solved the problem. This patient had a severely displaced head, severe TM joints, if you want to call it that, the teeth were, but the teeth were centered up. The patient was functioning beautifully because what happened in this case was a delay in growth. One side did not grow as fully as the other. This is in complete contradiction to everything I understood. If a patient had an asymmetrical mandible, it was because they had failure on one side or overgrowth on the other. Wrong call. In Bjork's cases, the patient's mandible chose not to develop fully. This was a deliberate action of the body not to center the mandible by growing to full, throwing the mandible off by growing full height. The body chose not to develop to its full potential, but in doing so, it had to compensate so that the patient could survive. And they did so. It's a wonderful article. I have it in the literature, in my blogs. If you want to find it. This is it. I thought of putting it into this series, but there were too many things to explain. And the biggest was, was how can I explain all this wonderful stuff I've been talking about in such contradictory terms? <laughs> it's taken me most of my career. Absolutely. <laughs> the body. Absolutely. But the body knew better than I did. But I think, absolutely. In other words, biotensegrity. The body knew how to balance itself out beautifully. Um, Gavin, there's a question here from anonymous attendee. Is it possible to be a bruxer and a mouth breather at the same time? Or does a bruxing habit 
force the tongue into the wrong position? Now, that to me is a good question in the sense that it brings the tongue into the picture. Yes. What do you feel is the role of the tongue? Away you go. The boxing almost certainly is secondary. The tongue is a primary problem. If you don't understand tongue development and the maturation of the tongue between the suckling atom, atom of the newborn, and a lot of them have problems. And if you don't know about that, you leave the child with a potential orthodontic problem. So the very first place I start orthodontics, I don't really do it, is have that child see an osteopath or a physiotherapist or someone who can start to straighten up the head because that tongue is going to do damage. And as an orthodontist, I would not see that damage till the patient is six or seven at the earliest. And by, the, by then, the, the tongue and the bruxing is well established. You really can't solve a bruxing problem. Bruxing problem is an attempt by the patient to solve the problem themselves. And mostly it's because the tongue is caused, has caused a symmetry and the tongue is desperately trying to correct that symmetry. It's either an anteroposterior fault or a lateral fault. Sometimes it's both. And the tongue, bless it, is doing its best to get it right. So the tongue is the first line of defense. So bruxing, now they have severe bruxing when they're shedding a tooth. That's different. When, the, when they shed a tooth, the bruxing may go on for a week or 10 days. That's them get rid of the baby tooth. That doesn't count. What does count is the patient that's bruxing enough to wake up the whole family. They, and that child will often take to sucking their thumb and attempt to relieve the bruxing. Bruxing is a red flag. I better pay attention to what it's telling me. Bruxing is a first class signal. Pay attention to the rest of the body. And the mouth is desperately trying to relieve the problem by way of balancing the teeth. Does that answer that one, I hope? Absolutely, Gavin, thank you. Um, <clears throat> that just leads into the next question. What are your thoughts about tongue tie? Ankylioglossia. Ankylio Lovely. I, these questions are almost too good. <laughs> tongue tie is a splendid book out by a man called Tetlo. I mention it because it's the quickest way to get a tongue tie sorted out. A tongue tie maybe you have to be relieved with right at birth. And in the, the institutes that know all about this, one of the in, things a pediat in, the pediatrician or the obstetrician will do is put his finger in the mouth and find out what is there a tongue tie. Then he'll do the same for the lips. In other words, he's seeing is the tongue capable of the kind of movement that is necessary for that child to suckle. How can you kick the tongue forward if it's anchored at the back? And so um, the, the book is called, oh dear, um, it, Ted wrote the man's name, look him up. He's excellent on tongue ties and how you relieve them. It's all about that and nothing else, but it's something everyone should have on their shelf. Is this a tongue tie? Does it matter? And the answer is, very probably yes, and does it matter? Yes, yes, yes. So your, um, your duty, and as a father or as a parent, and your child's having great difficulty feeding, it goes to breastfeeding within, because they have to, immediately you have to think of tongue tie. The tongue can't do its job, the child is unable to suckle, and is starving or crying all the time. It can't Absolutely. function properly because the tongue is anchored. So yes, it is a major concern to be treated within the first, at the very least, within the first six months, preferably within the first week. Mm. Um, thank you, Gavin. Um, wonderful reply. What, how do you spell the surname of the author that you mentioned? It's by the name, oh. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> not a problem. What you can do is let us have it by email and then we can distribute it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'd love to look it up. 
But I, I would value it. I'd better stay here and give it my email. I, I've got a great collection of books. I love my books, but at the moment I can't get my hands on that one. It's Absolutely. I, I um, we have, my email. Thank you. We have from anonymous attendee the question: what part, in your opinion, do epigenetic factors play? in the pathogenesis of malocclusion within the person's lifetime and the influence over the previous generations in human evolution. I didn't quite catch the first part of that question. Can you see it again, please? Yeah, yeah. What part, in your opinion, do epigenetic factors play wow. in the pathogenesis of malocclusion within the Thank person's lifetime? You. This is probably one of the best research evidence we now have. When I was a student, the answer was ge genetics. It's genetic determinism decides everything. It doesn't, it doesn't. Good evidence, good solid evidence from science is that about 20% of who we are and how we function and what we look like is genetic. That's a pretty small percentage. Anything up to 60 to 80% is epigenetic. If you want to call it that, another name would be environmental. And that is where most of what we've been talking about comes from. So that you have to look at the epigenetic side, but you can't ignore both of them. Both are contributory, but we now understand the genetic factor is now much much less significant than the epigenetic factors. So it behooves us to understand how we get those epigenetic factors. And that brings us back to the newborn. And the best chance we have is in the first two to three years postnatal period of getting those epigenetic factors under control. If my colleague on the osteopath is successful, the epigenetic factors may not be addressed or need to be addressed at all. That's success. Maybe it would be someone else who would do it better than I can. Maybe the nasal surgeon can please the nasal airway and then that resolves the orthodontic problem. So there are many things, and this, as it is obviously becoming, is a team game. I need at least four to five primary health disciplines other than my own to understand how to look after this individual. And ideally, a patient should see at least an, a child newborn. This happens in the world of pathology. A local sick children's hospital, the first thing that happens to a, a cleft palate patient is admitted, is they're examined by every or at least five or six different departments. And then they have a meeting together to discuss what to do, who's going to do it, and when are they going to do it. They lay out a timetable for that, that service to be given. Who's going to work with who? I'll wait for you to do this. Obviously, the surgery is one of the earliest things to come, but better still, a dentist can construct a little mouthpiece which will reshape the palatal, the whole arch, which makes a surgeon's job infinitely better. Everybody wins, but the patient most of all, but the patient is choking and gagging on serious swallowing difficulties. Even the insertion of a tiny little plate tied to the patient's lapel, because they're only a week old perhaps, We've got this funny little thing in the mouth with a string to the pill so they don't swallow it. And the infant immediately begins to start swallowing as they should. Marvelous. I've seen this. I've worked with it. It's, it, it's truly magic to watch an infant with a, the severe caliphal cleft suddenly able to function with something beginning to resemble normality. It brings great joy. Everybody. So yes, there's a lot. Absolutely, bio ten biotensegrity at work. Um, <laughs> Gavin, three everybody. more questions, and then we'll run, <laughs> and then we'll run out of time. 
Um, the, the next one is, um, what are your thoughts on the concept of retractive orthodontics? There is so much controversy about um, extraction of teeth, um, uh, reverse uh, uh, or, or um, headgear um, and the airway, etc. What are you, please share your thoughts on um, retractive orthodontics. It's a dirty word. And the word, <laughs> no, I, I make, I hope funny. What, I, what I'm trying to say, I spent half my career extracting my cusps as part of my thing. For my cusped extractions, that was the only way I could solve what I had been taught. And now, thanks to my colleagues, some of whom have included in your series, I now understand and as long as I long understood a long time ago, retractive orthodontics it can do more damage. The very act of putting a neck strap across the upper three vertebrae produced serious problems. Example, my daughter, I put a neck strap on her at the age of 11 to give her retractive orthodontics. Subsequent to me, I now know she's 60 years old, she had neck problems and didn't bother to tell me about it for most of her life. And she'd been kept fit. The reason being, I threw the top three vertebrae out of alignment because of my retractive orthodontics. That's a cross I have to bear as a father. This is the kind of thinking that done such damage and the orthodontists are in despair and trying to avoid the responsibility for retractive orthodontics. It truly, truly has to be one of the major mishaps in any orthodontic program. And I really believe firmly it is now iatrogenic, meaning a damage, damage caused by the treatment. I have to see this as one of the major problems for most of our patients. And sadly, the group who suffered most of all are now in their 40s and 50s and 60s, having had iatrogenic orthodontics pulling everything back. And the result was they still have the problems and they've had a lifetime of difficulty. That's a heavy burden. I think it's time we face and, and accept it as one we have to bear. So I, I hope that answers that. I, I could go on at length at this, I think it's, I don't want to do so. I just to say briefly, this is one of the most serious, serious issues I can present to any audience. Please, I beg you, look at what's happening before you make a decision to extract teeth. Thank you, Gavin. Gosh, thank you. And thank you for sharing that personal story as well. It's appreciated. Um, second last question from anonymous attendee. Can the human body be trained to reverse the adverse effects of headgear, which has resulted in sleep apnea? There are two sides to this question, obviously. Um, <clears throat> the issue of retraction and sleep apnea. Um, and then obviously, um, can the human body be trained to reverse the adverse effects of headgear? This coming in an orthodontist who's been there and done that and now in another world. Let me tell you how I resolve, I get my patients to resolve it. I do, I did half a yoga for most of my adult life. The last 10 years, I do Qigong. And one of the things I do with Qigong is they practice neck exercises. And I've kept myself out of all kinds of trouble. I do Qigong every day of my life. I do about an hour of it. So all the things that should have gone wrong didn't go wrong. I've got a malfunction. I've got a problem in my joints. I've got this, I've got that. If I stop doing my Qigong in a week, I'm in deep trouble. I keep myself out of trouble by my own exertions. And I can teach my patients how to do this for themselves. It, there are many textbooks on this, and it's available, it's available for everyone. And many patients have found it by just 
you know, my neck rolls, it feels better. This, there are many, many tricks that people do to keep themselves out of trouble. Watch what happens, for example, when a patient goes to lift something heavy, watch what they do with their mouth. They stick the jaw forward. They know to avoid it. Another one I saw the other, in the last Winter Olympics, was that the skier got to the top of those horrendous ski jumps and he put something in his mouth, closed his teeth on it, and off he went into an 80, 80 meter jump into space. Terrifying, but he was stabilizing the jaw because that kept his whole body balanced. That was his solution. I even helped a, an, an Olympic gold medalist, a famous rower called Silken Lauman, who broke her leg two months before she was due to sail, row in the Olympics, end of the end of the world, but she got over it and put her leg together and I made an appliance for her. And she was able to row in her Olympic champion and she won third gold, a bronze medal with a leg, broken leg two months before. And that isn't a miracle. That's a miracle of the body's ability to heal from an injury a long way removed from the mouth. It was our own courage and what happened to her and our willingness to, to prevent her own problem. I hope that answers it. I work yes, wonderfully. And of, and of course, I, opens I, I, up a whole new avenue of questions. Um, I, I, but we won't I, I do, go there. I do sports medicine on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And, and Gavin, the very last question, this comes from Shahina Sultan. Um, have you ever worked with craniosacral therapists? And what is your opinion of their value in your work? This brings us to the, the best, best source I, I can give you, which is Natasha Terzo. Read her book, because I got the information from the work, the man she works with, called Derek Nordstrom. Derek is should have earned um, a, a, a Nobel Prize long ago. But he's a very self-effacing, modest guy whose work is truly, truly brilliant. He and his osteopaths worked four-handedly for many years. And in, thanks to that, he learned his osteopathy and what he could do with his appliances to correct the cranial problems. Tasha has this done far better than I have. Buy her book. I've no, nothing to gain from it except to get you quicker to some answers. She, is, she really is a, a gift to orthodontics. And I'm very grateful to her. Not because, I just that she's honest, she's willing to recognize her skills and what, where she needs help. She gets help from the from the, de orthodont, the dentist, not the orthodontist, and from myofunctional, more functional therapists who work with this. So read Tasha's book as the best single way I can get you to answers on that one. Thank you. Gosh, Dr. James, that's been an absolute marathon session. And thank you for um, all your honest answers um, and for your very um, personal opinions. We really do appreciate that. Um, our biggest wish now, of course, is that we can invite you to South Africa. You and I have discussed it for a long time. And of course, I have Nottle on my wish list. Um, but I think the next step now for us is to get you to South Africa. It's been an absolute fascinating evening and um, all the attendees, um, bar a few, have stayed all the way through. So I think you've certainly held everyone's attention to the second, to the word. Well, there I, is... I, I, <clears throat> yes, I'm very thankful because I talked to an orthodontic audience and I think I had 10 people left out of 150. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, said, you know, <laughs> I, I, I measure my, my success by how many people I have left, not many. Well, the, the point you. is, I, it's I, a I, real I, pleasure. I think it's a wonderful audience. I wish you every goodwill. And I think this, I hope I've given you enough courage 
to go for it. And I've been happy to I share your joy. I hope to Thank join. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you. And we and we share your special knowledge and expertise and for being such a wonderful um, colleague. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Gavin. Good. I think the next thing we need to do now, I believe, is press the leave button and um, I'll, yeah. I'll be in touch. Yeah, okay, just release one thing. Just...